In this video, we're going to talk about heat pumps and solar panels in 2024. And if you're tuning into this channel for the first time and you haven't done so already, please make sure you smash that like button for the algorithm and consider subscribing to the channel if you're not already subscribed. We put out daily and weekly content on how you can get the best HVAC for your home and stay up to date on the latest in HVAC and home efficiency trends. And at the end of this video, I'll make sure to link a few other videos to some of our favorite inverter air conditioners that we use, but more on that later. And I'll also link a video that talks about how to calculate your break even period when you're looking at solar panel purchase as well as heat pump purchase because there's a way that you want to do that that accounts for both inflation the equipment cost and what your future energy costs are going to be and so we show you how to calculate that in that video and I'll make sure to link that at the end of this video as well now that being said when it comes to heat pumps and solar one of the biggest pieces of advice that we give people is to always go for the highest efficiency system you can get but there's more than just going out and getting the highest sear rating because that's not always going to give you the best system for a system that is on solar. One thing that we always recommend for people that have solar setups is getting an inverter. And the reason you want an inverter driven system is because when it first starts up, it's going to have a lower power consumption than even a two stage system and definitely a lot lower power consumption than a single stage system. So the most important thing is the type of system and the type of system that we recommend for all homes with solar panels is going to be a inverter driven system because it's going to have lower amp draw on startup. Now, most people have a grid tied solar system, which means that you're still connected to the grid. So this is not as important as if you're on battery backup, because if you're on battery backup, it's definitely important that you get something with a lower amp draw, just because it's going to provide less wear and tear on your batteries. Because when that heat pump first kicks on, if it has a turn down ratio, which is basically it's operating bandwidth, where let's say it can operate from 10% capacity up to 100% capacity, Whereas a single stage system can only operate at 100% capacity. That means that if you know your inverter kicks on when it first starts up, it might only pull two amps of power. Whereas a single stage system might be pulling 20 or 30 amps of power, depending on the size of that system. And again, like I said, if you have a grid tie system, meaning that your solar system is still connected to the grid, you still get a bill from the local utility, then it's not as important because if your power draw ever exceeds that of what's in your battery storage, it's just going to pull it from the grid. But this does, either way, in both scenarios, inverters do provide a little bit better technology for a few reasons. Now, number one is going to be comfort. Inverters, hands down, are not just more efficient, but they're also quieter. And so from a comfort perspective, when they first kick on, instead of coming on at 100% capacity, they're coming on at variable capacity. So for example, some of the Bosch systems that we recommend and we like a lot, which again, those will be some of the videos that are linked at the end of this video, they start off at about 25 to 30% capacity, depending on which model you're looking at, which means that it's at about a third of its operating capacity when it first kicks on. When you compare this to a single stage system that might only comes on at 100% capacity, it makes a big difference in both comfort and also how quiet it is, which again, that ties into your comfort. And so that's one of the biggest benefits of going with an inverter system in addition to the efficiency and how it interacts and ties into your solar setup. Now, if you currently don't have a heat pump and you're adding a heat pump and you currently don't have solar and you're also wanting to add solar, there's a few pieces of advice I have for you. Now, number one is going to be how you size both the solar system and how you size the heat pump. The first thing to consider when it comes to sizing your solar system is you want to make sure that it's sized big enough to offset 100% of your usage and potentially 100% of your future usage if, for example, you plan on adding an EV or something in the future. This is something that is not as important if there is some expandability, but depending on your utility, they may or may not have a lot of red tape in order for you to add solar production later. So it might not be as simple as throwing a few more solar panels on your roof if you're trying to increase your output. One thing that we recommend, because for example, in Excel territory in Denver, Colorado, which is one of the markets we're based in, we only are able to size up to 120% capacity when it comes to solar, which means that if you use a thousand kilowatts in a month, we can put in a system that will produce 1200 kilowatts of solar. And the reason is, is they don't want you to have so much solar production that you're not using all of it. But what we recommend, because especially if you just add one EV, for example, in the future, that will offset a lot of that. You'll start using a lot of that excess solar production very quickly. And so if you're sizing to make sure you're one offsetting 100% of your usage, one thing we recommend is actually increasing your usage prior to this. So this is going to be done by running your electric appliances for the two or three months leading up to your solar installation. You're going to want to use those bills because let's say you're 
their highest production is June, July, and August, right? Which is very common in a lot of uh, metropolitan areas, just because those are the hottest times of the year. That's when your air conditioner is running year long. If you are normally set it at 75 degrees, maybe you set it at 70 degrees and you leave the windows cracked in some of the rooms so it's not very efficient. You might be thinking, oh my gosh, Howard, that sounds terrible. My bill is going to be so high. I promise you, you're just doing this temporarily a little bit. And then what it does is it allows you to offset your production so that you're able to come in a little bit higher. Um, you can even just throw a space heater in the garage and run a space heater. You're going to heat, you know, nothing, or you could even plug it in, you know, someplace outside, hopefully under an awning. So it's not hit by, you know, rain and things like that. Um, but bottom line is you could plug in a space heater or something and run that. And that's going to jack up your electric bill. If you're a nerd like me, you could mine Bitcoin. That'll jack up the electric bill too. But the bottom line is doing that. It's going to show the utility higher consumption. And so basically they're going to allow you to put in a larger system. Now, this doesn't apply to all metropolitan areas. Like I said, Excel and core territory, this is how it's regulated. So we can't just throw in a system without showing sizing and backing up why we're putting in the uh, system that we're putting in. They want to see what our actual usage has been first. Now, the other reason I point this out is that if you currently don't have a heat pump, heat pump is going to increase your capacity on a year round basis, or it's going to increase your consumption on a year round basis. So you want to be able to make sure you have the production to offset that additional consumption that you're going to have in the winter months. So if you look at your bill for a 12 month period without a heat pump, and then you add a heat pump, you have to take into account that whatever your bill was in the summer for those summer months, you could guess that that's what it would be in the winter months. This is not true if you're upgrading to a higher efficiency system. Like if you have a 10 seer, let's say an old, you know, 20 year old HVAC system at your house right now, and you're putting in a, a new Dyken fit, that's not going to apply. Your bill will probably go down regardless, even by adding a heat pump, you're going to have less electricity consumption, at least for your HVAC, because it's just so much more efficient, but it's still something, the bottom line that you want to consider your specific situation so that you're not left with expectations where you thought you were going to be offsetting hundred percent of your usage. And then you suddenly find out you're not. Now, one other thing I want to talk about is battery backup as well as something like using your EV as your battery backup because if you look at the new F-150 Ford Lightning which can actually be connected to your grid can be connected to your electrical panel as an actual backup where it has two-way power to power your house let's say when you go to sleep at night you can actually use your battery or during peak demand hours is how they advertise it as it's something where you can use your car Azure battery backup. We're going to talk about why this is a bad idea or what the actual cost of it is. But before we do that, if you haven't done so already, please make sure you smash that like button and subscribe to the channel if you're enjoying this content so far. Again, it takes a lot of time and energy to put out content like this, and it's a free way you can show your support and it's much appreciated. Or the truth about battery backup that I really want to touch on, especially in the context of using your car as your power wall, for example, is that using it as a battery backup for the event of, let's say, a catastrophic power failure, where this is one way that your system can be set up when the electricians are installing it is that they can essentially put in an automatic transfer switch between your EV charger and your car. If it's a car that, like I said, is set up for this. So the, the Ford F-150 Lightning with the extended range batteries has this capability where it can actually power your house through as a battery backup in the event of a power loss. The reason that this isn't a bad idea is because, you know, if power doesn't go out that often, let's say your power goes out, let's say you're in an area that's really windy, there's always down power lines, whatever, it goes out once a month. It's only gonna be once a month that you're using the battery backup. It's probably only for eight hours, maybe 12 hours. I don't know, it depends on your specific situation. But for example, like at our house, we do get high winds, we are in the mountains. When we get snowstorms, sometimes trees fall on power lines and things get collapsed or transformers fry, whatever. It seems like things always happen uh, during a snowstorm. Let's say we get a massive storm and the power goes out. Typically for us, it might go out for a few hours and it's typically one or or two days a year, if that. It's not really that critical where it's gonna come on a lot. Now, the reason that is okay is because it's not putting that much wear and tear on your battery. The reason I advise against using your battery in your car, especially as a battery piggy bank, is that it's actually not cost effective to run it that way, and I'll explain why. Now, depending on which market you're in, and when I say market, I mean which region, your utility is gonna have widely varying rates. So let's say you pay 22 cents per kilowatt hour for electricity, let's say you pay 30 30 cents per kilowatt hour. In another metro, you might pay 15 cents per kilowatt hour, which in Denver at the office,
price, we pay about 12 cents per kilowatt hour. The reason that we advise against using your battery backup is that let's say you install a battery backup like a Tesla Powerwall or something, and the way you want to use it is that during peak demands, let's say peak demand is three to 10 and you have a variable rate plan through your utility, where at those times they charge 50 cents or 60 cents a kilowatt hour. The reason we advise against switching off the grid and going to your battery backup during those hours is the actual cost for the equipment typically in terms of wear and tear is going to be upwards of 30 cents per kilowatt hour just for the battery backup in terms of wear and tear on it and life expectancy in terms of what it took to actually manufacture that battery and make it. Let's say peak demand usage rate is 30 cents per kilowatt hour. Then it's basically just a wash and you're using your backup. You're putting extra wear and tear on your backup battery, which is fine if it's a power wall, but if it's your car, you're really just reducing the long term range of that EV because you're putting wear and tear on that battery. It's minimal. It's not a, a ton, but it still does degrade over time. And it's just unnecessary degradation or unnecessary use for a moderate, if any, sort of gain in terms of monetary savings. So one of the things that we recommend people do if they're using battery backup is not trying to do it from a savings perspective, but more trying to do it from the perspective, hey, I'm trying to offset some of my power consumption if there's a power outage versus something that's compared to if there's a vent with the utility where they raise our rates for a certain period of time and then I'm able to use kind of some of that stored solar. I say take this with a grain of salt because kilowatt rates vary widely across different metropolitan areas. So if you're in an area like Southern California where you might have a very high electric rate, this might not apply and that battery backup is actually cheaper to run, in which case ignore this advice and install a battery backup. But if you're on in a commercial building where we have a 12 cent per kilowatt hour rate, it makes no financial sense for us to install a battery backup here unless we're just doing it because we want battery backup in case of a power outage, but those rarely happen here. So we rarely use them. And that's why we really only recommend using them kind of in, as a backup generator versus using them as a way to reduce your reliance on the grid. Now, it is great for regions like Southern California where they have periods of rolling brownouts and rolling blackouts. That is great because then when the grid is shutting down, hey, you're still in business, your air conditioner is running, your stereo is still blasting, it's still party time at your house when the rest of the block is shut down and closing all the blinds while they pray for the power to come back on. But the bottom line is there's lots of opinions out there and we try to stay biased as neutral and just look at kind of the facts of how you wanna put in the best system for your home, the best system for your specific situation. So if you're in planning on installing a heat pump and solar panels, we hope you found this content helpful. And if you happen to be in one of the areas we service like Denver, Colorado or Phoenix, Arizona, you can actually schedule an appointment with us for free. We come out for free for all first time customers, whether that's for a service call or annual maintenance, or if you're just looking for an estimate for system replacement. And there's actually a link in the description below where you can actually schedule online at your convenience, as well as an up-to-date list of the cities and states that we service. So you can stay up to date when we start servicing your Metro. And as mentioned earlier, there's a few videos popping up on the screen with some of our favorite heat pumps. We hope you enjoyed this content. Uh, please make sure you smash that like button and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. And as mentioned earlier, there's a few videos popping up on the screen right now. So make sure you check those out if you haven't done so already. And we will catch you on the next episode.